Good evening and welcome to the Summer 2021 Open Lectures brought to you by the University of York. My name is Matt Matravers and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's event. At this stage in a normal year, I suppose I'd be telling you things about what are called housekeeping issues like where the toilets are and that we have no fire alarms uh, or fire practices uh, scheduled for tonight, but I guess you know where the loos are. And uh, if there are fire alarms where you are, I'm very sorry. We're in a different kind of world. So uh, instead of housekeeping, I have some technical notes for you. Should you have any issues such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. If you're watching live, you'll be able to ask questions for Julian Bagini throughout using the Q&A button on your screen. And we will take as many of those as we can throughout the second half of the event. Live captioning is switched on. And if you'd like to switch it off, you can do so via the closed captions or live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Please also remember that tonight's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again on YouTube in a few days time and also share with friends and networks who may be interested. For those of you engaged in social media, you can also use the hashtag York Ideas, or one word, uh, to join in the conversation on whichever social media platform you choose. I'm delighted to be introducing tonight's event which is the first Heslington Lecture that we've run in some years. The Heslington Lecture was set up by the university at its very beginning in 1963, with a remit to invite high profile speakers to discuss the topic of religion and the modern world. As some of you may know, the University of York is a distinctly and deliberately secular university. It was set up not to have any admissions criteria, such as that you had to be a member of the Church of England and not to have a theology department or religious studies department. But nevertheless, as the Hesington Lecture uh, suggests, uh, it, it engages with issues of religion as they apply to the modern world. And I'm delighted that Julian Bagini's talk and discussion is going to be precisely in that kind of area. Julian is a very unusual creature. Uh, he's, he's one of the UK's best known public philosophers and public intellectuals, and a man who actually, actually manages to be a philosopher for a living outside of the academy. He's been committed to the idea of public philosophy, of bringing philosophy to the public uh, for as many years as I can remember, and was the founding editor of a philosopher ma philosophy magazine, which um, did that job really remarkably well and continues to do so. He's moved on from that and is now the academic director of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. He still writes regularly for a variety of national and international newspapers and magazines, and is often on TV and working for think tanks and other other such activities as a philosopher. Tonight, Julian will be in conversation with award-winning author and journalist, Madeline Bunting, about his recent, most recent book, The Godless Gospel, Was Jesus a Great Moral Teacher? Madeline will also be joining us as a speaker in this year's York Festival of Ideas, talking about her most recent book on the crisis of care, and we shall share that information on her event with you at the end of this talk. So it really is a delight for me to be able to introduce Julian and Madeline, who will converse with each other and then pick up uh, question and answers, uh, questions from the Q&A, um, and then I will come back right at the end. So over to you, Julian and Madeline. Thank you very much, Matt, for that introduction. Well, Julian, we've got a huge subject in front of us, so I'm going to just get stuck in straight away. Um, my first question is an obvious one, which of course is why on earth did you take on this task? But I think there's some important things that the audience needs to know about. One was that you were a, uh, a keen Christian as an adolescent. Uh, and, um, and I wondered whether there was some sort of reckoning with, with that past experience involved in this. Um, it was always going to be a minefield. You knew that. Um, you could have obviously run the risk of getting attacked from all sides. There's plenty of Christians who will say, you've missed the point take the divine out of the gospel and you don't have very much and then of course there's many non-christians who actually don't ha have any interest in the subject at all um, they don't know anything about christianity and they don't think there's any reason uh, to want to know about it their understanding of christian ha history has has so uh, put them off the whole subject so the interesting thing is that you decided to launch yourself into this minefield 
why was that? <laughs> um, I think it's always very tricky to, uh, to uh, you know, speculate about one's own motivations. <laughs> doesn't always necessarily know what they are. I wasn't worried about um, believers saying I'd missed the point because in a way I acknowledge that in the book. It's clearly the case that if you think Jesus was the son of God, then you have a very different kind of creature if you take the divine out of it. Um, the, the question is rather given that most people i think it's fair to say most people today do not believe that jesus was the son of god in any literal sense but the people still continue to say you know that this is a standard expression i don't believe jesus was the messiah but i believe he was a great moral teacher it's really to kind of push at that and try and ask well why why do you say that because I think if you ask a lot of people who said that casually, they really wouldn't have much more to say other than the fact that Jesus preached uh, forgiveness and, and love for everyone, which are not even necessarily distinctively Christian messages. But for me and my background, it's true. I was quite serious about religion when I was younger. And I think the one thing that marks out people who in later life become atheists, one thing that kind of unites them with people of faith is that they both take these issues very seriously. And in the UK, in a culture in which most people traditionally haven't, I found that, you know, through most of my adult life, once I left Catholic primary school, religion was just kind of an irrelevance to most people's life. And I didn't do that thing. I don't think I ever did that thing of um, leaving religion and just going to the other extreme. I've always remained interested in what, you know, religion might be getting at, what might be useful and, and truthful in it. So in that sense, it's just continuous with my lifelong interest of, of trying to kind of not throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you like, and, you know, not kind of assume that because I don't believe in a God and I, I don't believe in a life to come, etc., that therefore there's nothing to be learned from religion. Great. So moving on to how you start the book, as it were, you know, I, 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 I loved your first chapter. I felt you jumped right into the deep end. And it was great. You know, you really took the reader by the sort of scruff of their neck with this concept of um, a revolution of the soul, uh, metanoia. And um, I just wondered if you could explain that, because it's it's a really big idea, first of all, isn't it? I mean, I can think of lots of ways that people on this project, this task might have started in other places mm. uh, that sort of eased eased the reader into the big one. But this is the big one and you sock it to us straight away. So can you explain a little bit about what you understand metanoia to be? Well, I had to start with that because, you know, again, if you if you come to this sort of like just thinking, well, what was Jesus really about? A lot of people say, well, fundamentally, Jesus preached love or or fundamentally preached forgiveness. And, and, but that's really kind of you're basing that judgment on just simply what's most memorable or what's been repeated the most. I mean, I came to this because. Obviously, I, I read uh, the Gospels very carefully, um, you know, deleting the supernatural bits so that to see what was left with the moral teaching. And it seemed to me that the, the only the, the, the thing which really unified it, if there's one thing that held it all together, um, which gave it a purpose, it was this idea of the transformation of the self. So metanoia is a kind of, you know, a, a change of heart or a change of soul, if you like. And I think that so much of what Jesus teaches comes back to that and has to be understood in that context. So, for example, I mean, people are often very attracted to the idea that Jesus, you know, preached that we should give to the poor and, and that blessed are the poor, etc. And I think that there's a way to understand that which is quite comfortable for a modern, uh, say, Westerner in particular, which is that, yes, you know, the rich have an obligation to the poor, and that's because, you know, we want everyone to have this rich life. But I think if you do actually look carefully at what Jesus said about this, the concern for the poor, it, it wasn't because he, he wanted everyone to have a materially wealthy life, okay? Those things just aren't of great importance to him. What was important was to, to make yourself the best person you could be and to be pure. So a lot of the stuff about acting for the poor, in a strange way, there is a kind of self-interest about it. Um, this, this kind of paradox, I think you see in lots of religious traditions, that the idea that by, in some sense, emptying yourself and by making your own selfish interests um, less central, there is a, a deeper sense in which you serve yourself and you elevate it. 
It sounds paradoxical, but I think that many religions have, have explained how, how that is the case. So I think unless you understand that what Jesus is primarily concerned about is a transformation of the self and a transformation of the soul, then all the particular things he says about poverty and forgiveness, etc., cetera, um, they don't really make sense. They don't really have uh, the, the proper rationale. And when you say a transformation of the self or, or, or this idea of a revolution of the soul, I'm still finding it a little bit blurred. I wonder if you could bring it a bit more into focus. What, what is the change that, that you feel Jesus was calling for? And what, if it's a change of heart, what's the change consist of? Yeah, well, I mean, this is where, you know, I, I don't buy the whole package, I have to say. You know, I find it very interesting and I think it's very challenging. But I, I think, you know, the emptying he's talking about and, and this is, has certain similarities, I think, with other traditions, you know, such as the Stoics, for example, who a lot of people have pointed out have a lot of similarities with Christ's message. It, it's, it's really the idea that one has to kind of, you know, detach oneself from the sort of worldly concerns, concerns around acquisition, and even sort of concerns for the body. It's a concern with your, your ethical self to make yourself the best person you can be from a moral point of view. And that this requires a great discipline and the same, a kind of detachment. And the reason I don't go along with it, because I think that ultimately, um, and this is where I think it's important, perhaps whether or not you have the theological dimension or not, that there may be some rationale for that with certain theological assumptions. But if, if you believe that this is the only life we have and we are mortal and we are physical creatures, then this, this process of kind of detaching ourselves from worldly concerns, I think is pushed to, too much in Jesus because we are, we are of the world. So although I think- We'll come in, a, sorry, Julian, you have a terrific chapter on renunciation of the world. And it's a, it's a I think a really particularly interesting dimension of Jesus's teaching. So we'll come back to that that one but I'm, I'm interested and I'm just going to press you a little bit about this this kind of metanoia and the, the sort of born again concept because I, I'm, I, I would imagine that that ego is a crucial issue here that there is some sense in which one is um, giving up the ego transforming the ego um, and I, I'd also would expect another word to have cropped up in your definition really which is around love because after all that is you know that is the great kind of, you know, all religious texts are full of love or compassion. I mean, you know, that's that's their shtick, isn't it, really? Mm. So um, that I just wondered how the, how the word ego and the word love slash compassion fit into this concept of metanoia. Yeah, on the, on the ego thing, I'm not entirely sure. And this is one of the things where it's quite difficult to understand things in ways which aren't anachronistic. I mean, I, one, of, one of the things I did in the book was I had conversations uh, with several sort of theologians and Christian philosophers, because I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, have some kind of reality check of what, what I was saying and, and whether I was getting, getting things right. And one of them pointed out that, you know, we, we have a very, it's a very modern idea to think of the kind of the, the inner self and the outer self, the inner and the outer. And I think when people think of the, the, the e ego, Perhaps people think about it in the modern psychological sense of this kind of inner core of being something internal, and I think it. I, I can. I can. I think I accept the fact that that's probably anachronistic. So it's about the self, if you like. So it's about self-interest and rather than other interest. And I think it's. And this is this is where it connects with with love. I think there is a sense in which what you're being encouraged to do is to not be pursuing your own self-interest as the primary thing but to serve others but I think what's curious about this is I mean in a way that that sounds almost a bit too pat and a bit too familiar it doesn't seem to me <laughs> that the primary sort of interest in Jesus is that kind of um, love of others because actually he preaches a kind of the, the kind of love that you get in, in Jesus's teachings is, is in a sense quite impersonal it's not based on the kind of attachment. So family, for example, you, you might have to come to this later. I mean, family is something he kind of rejects as, as, a, as a concept. Your, your family is everyone, but by, by making your family everyone, you're diluting those ties of family. So the, the kind of, in a way, what's more important is to lose that kind of egocentric focus. And that seems to be more important in what he's saying than in fact you become very kind of benevolent in that kind of warm-hearted way and I know that's not what people think of when they think of Jesus they think of Jesus as the person 
promoting love and compassion, etc. But there's, there's something quite austere in his message and, and you'll need to, to separate yourself from, from close contacts and, and the concerns of the world. Yeah, well, I, 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 your point about the sort of um, how he teaches around intimate relationships, I think is, is a really interesting one and perhaps we can pick that up again. Um, I, I mean, uh, Richard has made a very interesting point. It's just commenting that he sees metanoia suggesting a turn from a life lived from love as opposed to a life lived out of fear. Um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's interesting that the kind of concept of turn. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, now, having sort of put this very radical notion of metanoia in your first chapter, you then uh, talk about virtue ethics uh, and character. Um, perhaps you could explain a little bit about how that concept fits in with the metanoia and how you're sort of building your argument as you were, as it were. Yes, I mean, again, I think one thing that's, that's very interesting to, to look at is if you look at the sort of scholarship ar around this, I mean, it's very clear that yeah, some people have a naive, naive idea that Jesus sort of came out of nowhere with these ideas and that everything he said was radically new. And there's virtually nothing that Jesus said which someone hadn't said elsewhere. And there's lots of what he says is very much in tune with other forms of thinking from the, the classical world, the Greek or Roman world. And, and one of the ideas that was sort of very popular throughout that was this idea of what we now call um, virtue ethics. And the idea here is if we think about ethics and morality uh, today, I think most people still perhaps think of it in terms of rules and precepts, you know, uh, 10 commandments, thou shalt not, or in a secular terms, the utilitarian demand, you know, you should do whatever promotes the, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, virtue ethics rather says that the, the, the core of, of living well and being a good person is becoming a person of good character. And um, there's this very nice saying from a, a, a Zen monk, which I've quoted many times, which is, you know, that a person of, of good character doesn't need precepts against stealing, right, or pre precepts against murder. And similarly, if you're a bad person, having a rule against murder or rule against stealing doesn't stop you. What really makes people act well or not is whether they have become a person of good character. And in a way, the kind of rule, the kind of rules we give people, uh, we give the rules to people like children or people who are struggling to kind of set strong lines that they don't overstep. But we kind of know that as we grow up and become adults, if you if you need to be reminded that you shouldn't murder someone uh, or else you will murder them, clearly you're already a very, very depraved person. So the way that sort of fits in with the metanoia idea is that, again, it's this idea of transformation of, of the self. And, and this is what put Jesus in conflict with a lot of the you know, Jewish authorities at the time, because his criticism of them was that their understanding of the law had become all about, you know, do's and don'ts and rules, all about the external actions and nothing about the spirit in which those things are done or the purpose for which they are done or the motivation for which they are done. So many of those famous passages where he challenges the, the letter of the law, you know, the, the classic thing is to say that Jesus appealed to the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. Well, another way of putting that is that what he was really concerned with was um, becoming a person who would be able to act in the spirit of the law rather than create the society in which people are compelled to follow the letter of laws. Yeah, yeah. I got the feeling there were several times there were comments that you made um, that you really don't like institutional Christianity very much. Uh, so just to pick one of those comments, mm. um, you you have a sort of, uh, you're, it's in the chapter on a revu revolution of the law. So it's, it's exactly this point that you're talking about now. Um, for the church to become more relevant to people, uh, it, it, um, it could do worse than preach less and focus more on offering an example of a higher, more selfless life. Um, it's interesting because actually that's not the task of your book to sort of critique uh, institutional Christianity, but you can't you can't resist it. <laughs> um, okay. And I thought, you know, if I if I had a pound for every time I've seen relevance in a church document, I would be immensely wealthy. Um, it's one of their favourite phrases, uh, you know, the search for relevance. Mm. But the causes as to why Christianity may not be relevant right now, uh, you know, this is this is boggy territory, it seems to me. Um, 
there's many, many reasons for why there are certain forms of institutionalized mm. religiosity that, that are in decline, steep decline. Mm. Um, but I just wondered um, if you could sort of, how did you manage to restrain yourself? What it is, I mean, speaking for myself, I remember I was in a Catholic ashram in India, aged 19, and a monk said to me, there is a huge paradox in human history that in institutionalizing ideas, they are inevitably compromised. But if they are not institutionalized, they will not survive. Mm. Well, that's a great Catholic kind of defense, of course. <laughs> Um, but it has some grain of truth. It's always stuck stuck with me. Um, yeah, look, I think I think that's true. I mean, my my when I take a swipe, if you like, at institutional religion, that's not gratuitous. And actually, it's often in the context of of trying to point out just how much institutional uh, religion is is totally contrary to to what Jesus taught. I think it's you know there are certain things. There's people say there's a lot of interpretation with the teaching of Jesus, and that that is true. Of course, there is. But one thing that seems absolutely clear is he is totally against clerical power and and clerical hierarchies. You know, none of none of you shall be rabbi. He tells his followers and things like this. So it's one of the great paradoxes of Christianity that you know the founding texts is totally against these clerical things, and 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 Christianity has become those things. I just think that's such a strong paradox that you kind of have to to to, put, to point it out. Now the defences, there are many defences of that. And, and one of them is that, you know, Jesus actually wasn't ever describing a template for centuries to come, right? He just doesn't do that. So if you believe in his message, if you believe in his message, you have to do something to, to fulfill that. And, and that's where the institutionalization comes in, the paradox that your uh, priest was, was talking about in, in the ashram. And I can kind of see that, but then when you look at just simply, yeah, there are different ways of having institutions, aren't there? And traditionally, the Christian ones have been so hierarchical, so much based on power, so much on creating, you know, these lines between the believers and the non-believers and the, the heretics and the so forth. This seems to me to be so absolutely counter to what Jesus taught that I, I had to point that out. As for myself, you know, I have my own issues with um, a lot of institutional religion, but I, I don't think I was really talking about those. I mean, well, inevitably your own kind of uh, feelings come into this, but I was really just trying to stress how much there is this disjunct between the founding text and the religion that bears its name. Yeah. Um, the chapter on the renunciation of the world, I thought, uh, I thought was really fascinating because I have to say, it seems to me that, you know, the way you laid it out was, I, I, I thought, really thought provoking because it, it sort of brought it home to me how deeply contradictory uh, Jesus' teachings are in this area, that you can read them many different ways. You know, on the one hand, don't worry about your food for tomorrow or your clothing, look at the, the lilies of the field, um, as if you don't need to pay any, you know, any attention to your sort of material well-being. On the other hand, then there is clearly tremendous tolerance for those who are wealthy, the tax collectors. Um, uh, and I, I wondered, you know, what, one of the things you were trying to find was coherence. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you think on that particular issue of the sort of relationship with the world that you found a, a um, coherence in the end? I, I think so. I think so. I think the appearance of incoherence is probably based on certain easy mistakes that, that people make. So, for example, there are passages you read which do make it sound a bit like there's a kind of karmic principle here and that actually you know if you renounce wealth in the end you will be wealthy you know that everything will be given to those who have none etc etc and that really breaks down that can't really be um that wouldn't be coherent and i think there's a certain, there's a principle of charity which philosophers often commend which is that you should always try and interpret any kind of philosophical system or idea that's presented to you in the way that makes it most coherent, coherent and, and not least. And maybe sometimes in doing that, you're, you're granting the idea, you're, you're making the idea better than it perhaps was in, in the um, hands of its formulator. But I don't think that would make sense, right? So, I mean, if, because if, 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 if it's good, if it would be good to become, if it would be good for the poor to become wealthy in the future, why is it bad for the wealthy to be wealthy now? It just, it simply makes no sense. So I think the way to make sense of it is, is this idea that 
it just simply is of no importance whatsoever. And again, you can take a comparison with the Stoics. The Stoics often said wealth is of no importance whatsoever. And precisely for that reason, it's not actually a big problem if you do have some wealth, just as long as you're not attached to it, you're not worshipping it, and you're not making it your goal. I mean, I, I, I think there are all sorts of problems that you can be led down to if you indulge yourself too, too much on that. But I think, yes, I mean, when, when, when Jesus was, you know, he, he has no reason to refuse the ointment on his feet um, because, you know, it's not that, well, because it's, not, it's, it's just comes and it goes, right? That's just not the important thing. And similarly, you know, there's also the other aspect of this, which is he repeatedly talks about how, you know, his concern is obviously to help the people who need help the most. And a lot of those people are, are the wealthy. So he's not going to do this thing of refuse to associate with the wealthy or sort of because, um, you know, to keep himself pure. He, he has to kind of get his hands dirty, as it were, in order to help clean things up. So I think there is a kind of coherence there. I say it's not, a, but that doesn't mean that I, I don't, the coherent package you're left with is too austere to me, but nevertheless, I think there is a kind of coherence. That's interesting, too austere, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, because I, as I say, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, if and this is where I think perhaps the lack of the theological dimension does make it a huge, huge difference. If you're a secular humanist who believes that this is the one life we have and that's that's the end of it, um, then I do think that there is something there's something kind of wrong in, in, in renouncing the, the joys and beauties of the world. And that includes you know, pleasures which may be fleeting and may be kind of of the body, but we are fleeting creatures of the body. And, um, uh, you know, I think, I think other philosophers, philosophers I look to with admiration uh, are really trying to kind of find that balance between allowing us to be fully human and allowing the place of these pleasures and loves and attachments in the real world without us becoming like slaves to them and overattached in ways which lead to, you know, hedonic cycles and constant dissatisfaction. I think that throughout history, you know, a lot of people have thought that the way to manage the problems we get when we become too attached to money, to wealth, to food, to sex, to love, is to say, don't get attached to any of it. I think that's a kind of a simplistic solution, which, which works in one way, but it deprives you of much which is of value. And I kind of support the view which says that life is very, very difficult and very complicated. And you're trying to get a very, very difficult balance between, um, you know, keeping your focus on the right things in life should have a place for these earthly delights too. Keeping them in the place is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. A couple more questions before I come to the audience. Um, so please, if you, if you want to make a comment or you have a question for Julian, uh, if you type it in the Q&A, I'm keeping an eye on that and uh, forgive me if I don't manage to cover everybody's comments and questions. It's quite hard to kind of cover cover everything, but I, I hope to try and bring in your comments. Um, so uh, and that's great. We've got quite a few coming up, so that's fantastic. So I'm just going to ask you a couple more points, um, Julian. Um, I have to say the nub of it, I thought, arrived um, in this chapter on making yourself humble, this sort of double aspect of the of an ethical ideal that Christianity sets up, um, which is so strict and so demanding that it's actually impossible to attain. Um, and that Christianity uh, obviously has the, the enormous emphasis on the mercy of God, the mercy of Jesus Christ, and of it, and the, indeed of the grace of God to sort of bridge that painful, painful um, uh, gap between the ideal and and the, ex to the extent to which any you know human being can really uh, follow that ideal um, and it seems to me that um, if you take out the sort of divine mercy it, it, it becomes pretty onerous and in a way what your last comment about the austerity uh, of, of Jesus's renunciation of the material world was sort of slightly pointing out this this issue that this is where it actually becomes very hard uh, to see Jesus as a as, as just a moral teacher, because if you take out all the divine, then you're just left with this unbelievably demanding ethical system where you're set up to fail. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, no. I, I, I kind of agree with with that to, to a certain extent. As I say, that the point is, I don't buy the whole system anyway. But then, uh, well, actually, there's a question about whether there's even a system here. To be honest, and what struck me was speaking to a lot of the Christians, theologians, and philosophers was that they said that Jesus isn't offering a complete moral system. He's taking a lot of things for granted from his background in Judaism, but he, he is giving us a lot of kind of like challenges and, and provocations. And in a sense, one can take these challenges and provocations no matter what broader system one may buy into. And I think this is where the idea of be the perfect is really interesting. Um, if you do moral philosophy in an Anglo-Saxon university, you'll inevitably come up upon this principle attributed to Kant, which is that ought implies can, which means that, you know, to say you ought to, to do something implies that you can do it. It would make no sense to say you ought to solve world poverty if it's not in your power to do so. How can you tell anyone they should do something when they can't actually do it? And this seems very intuitively obvious. It seems fair enough. But I remember many years ago, um, Simon Critchley actually um, yeah, writing about this, suggested it's the opposite, that ought implies cannot. And this is, in a sense, the, the great Christian message and perhaps one of other religions too. And I think the idea here is that there is something really valuable in having a kind of a moral aspiration, which is impossible. And, you know, going back to that thing of the Kant thing of saying, well, you shouldn't ever aspire to the impossible. Well, we kind of admire people who have those aspirations in the sphere of say art or sport, yeah? If I was an artist and I say, I'm constantly looking to make my work perfect, even though I'm never going to succeed. People don't say to you, well, you're an idiot then, do you? They say, no, no, I admire that, I can see that. You've got to reach <laughs> high, higher than you can achieve in order to get as high as you can. And I think that's a real value in this, this aspiration. Now, the point is, you're saying it sets us up for failure. So within the theological version of Jesus's teaching, God's grace, whatever you want to call it, bridges the gap. We can't get the whole way there, but God will, will forgive us and God will do whatever it is to, to bridge that gap. You don't have that consolation without God. But, you know, I, I think this is one of those areas in which not having the God to, to fill the gap actually makes the teaching more bracing and more relevant. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the very famous line, you know, greater love hath no man than he who lays down his life for his friend, I think is so much more powerful when you don't believe there's anything divine to bring people back to life. What makes a war memorial so moving to me is that people did lay down their lives. And if I just thought, well, they didn't lay them down, they just set them aside for a bit before they got them back again, that would not be the, the sacrifice. And Jesus on the cross, again, it's really not a tremendous sacrifice if, you know, if he knows he's back two days later, you know, to put it yeah. crudely. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to um, hold fire on, on a couple of other points that I was going to uh, raise and just have a quick scroll through the Q&A. Maybe you you can too, Julian. Mm. Um, uh, picking out Mark Vernon's question, does the death of God lead to the death of man, as it has been put? I suspect this is a real question if what Christianity introduces is an ontological ground for the human individual as God's I am, coinciding with the human I am archetypally in Jesus. Hence his rejection of family or city as the root of identity, and also concerns to do with the individual emerge from Christianity from free will and conscience to plagiarism. So removing God is a big deal. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I, this is this is a, uh, there's a lot going on in this question. And I'm not sure I, I get I get all of it. So apologies to Mark in in advance that I think this would probably be a longer conversation for the other day. But the death of God, the death of man. I mean, look, here's one thing Mark might mean, and it might not be what he, apologies if it's not what he does mean. There, there are quite a lot of people who have kind of made the argument that when you sort of attempt to kind of establish any kind of secular belief in morality, free will, et cetera, et cetera, without some kind of theological underpinning doesn't work. And the stories they give for that are partly because you know, the history of Western thought is, is rooted in Christianity very deeply. And a lot of these ideas, if you trace their origins, 
the argument goes, have, have kind of theological roots. So, you know, you, you take away God and you take away the Christian background, you actually take away a lot of what we, a lot of the assumptions underpinning uh, what secularists think we can happily have without God. Now, that's a very, very deeply involved argument. And I, I don't, I, I simply don't buy it for, for two reasons. Um, first of all, I think that Christianity is only one part of our heritage. We've also got, you know, the ancient Greek philosophy um, is an other part as well. And that provides a lot of the foundations. In fact, it also informed a lot of Christian theological thought as well. And the second point is I simply think that um, the, the fact that certain secular ideas historically emerged out of religious ones is simply an accident of chronology and history, if you like. What matters is whether those ideas stand up for themselves, not the, the history of where they came from. And I just think that, you, again, this would be a huge subject, but I think you can give a perfectly accurate, um, uh, a perfectly reasonable account of where morality comes from, where free will comes from on secular grounds. It's not the same thing as Christian morality. Maybe it's not the same thing as Christian free will, although heaven knows that um, you know, <laughs> theologians have hugely disagreed about human free will and we whether we have it over the years. So I, 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 I'm not, I, 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 the argument that, you know, when you take away God, you pull the rug from under the carpet of secular humanist ethical thought. I, I, I just, I don't buy it, I'm afraid. Um, so Julian, I'm gonna wrap two questions together here. So there's one from Roland Darrell and one from John Greenwood. Um, Roland says, well, what's the actual point? That the book is making and John says what's the essential or overriding message of Jesus or is there no main message and a way that this is the sort of you know 60 second pitch uh which is you know did you find it convincing did you find do you agree that Jesus is a great moral teacher if so what what's the great moral teaching well I don't think that I, okay so the first thing is like I said before I don't think there is like a, a system to be extracted here which is a system to live by right and I don't think he's a great moral teacher in the sense that, you know, if I was to choose, if I was to advocate to people who should you take as the basis of your moral thought, I would pick various people ahead of him, such as Aristotle or Confucius, David Hume, and people like that. But I do think there's a tremendous value in, in Jesus as a kind of a challenge to us, particularly, I think, in, in our kind of, if you're living in a comfortable kind of Western world. So let me so let me one example of this. You know, I, I think I would look to Aristotle more than I would to Jesus for my ethical guidance. But it has to be said that Aristotle's ethics is based about the idea of human flourishing. And, you know, he wrote it essentially, his audience were privileged free people of Athens. It wasn't a vision of the good life that was open to everyone. And we still live in a world in which that vision of the good life isn't open to everyone. So I think this, this kind of... Um, uh, this, this deep challenge to us that we shouldn't sort of get too comfortable in this and you know to remember the poor etc is, is very very important um and also you know just the idea that uh, the, the second question about is there a central message i think you started with it madeline this idea of metanoia that really you know unless we're serious about changing ourselves unless ethics is not about following certain rules and following certain steps it's about work on the self and I think this is something which our culture today lacks a lot I mean we talk about self-care and self-improvement but virtually everything that comes under that name is about either increasing our ability to achieve in worldly terms or improving our own emotional state so that we're happier or more content where is the focus on self-improvement as that really hard thing of make yourself a better person, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if it means you have to look at things you don't want to look at, even if it means you actually have to renounce certain comforts. And so I think that's why the, the, the challenge, uh, the Jesus remains a very important challenge to us today. Great, great. I'm just gonna have a quick look to see if I can um, pick out some more questions. Can, can I just come to one? Because actually at the top of the list I can see is one from David yeah. Jesus, which is about the authentic message of Jesus. I thought it was worth um, addressing that one because I think some people, uh, it's, my, it's an easy thing to assume that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get to the authentic Jesus. And I actually do think that's a fruitless enterprise. You know, I think the fact is nobody knows. You know, Obviously a person of faith does believe that somehow the gospels are 
um, uh, you know, well, not a, a correction, a certain type of person of faith <laughs> or a certain type of faith believes the gospel will somehow give us this accurate historical record. But, you know, it, unless you have that kind of belief, we know that we, we don't have any idea really about what Jesus really said. And there are people who have a go at it and they're, they're and I, I take my hat off to them, but it is kind of speculative. So it's, for me, it's not about the authentic message of Jesus at all. Um, and it's not even about what the most coherent message of the Jesus of the Gospels is, because the Jesus of the Gospels is um, divine in some way. He does perform miracles. He has a theological mission. So my interest is, is just rather if we don't buy into Jesus in that way, if we if we ha if we assume all the miracles and stuff is made up, are we left with anything interesting at all? And that's that's the idea. Authentic. I, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. And that's not the purpose. I, I suspect there may be a few theologians that would get very cross with you at that point, Julian, because they've spent a, a, a lifetime uh, <laughs> studying the sort of historical Jesus and, and what we can know and what we can become. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. As, as a lay observer of this, it seems yeah, to yeah. be no, very optimistic fine. to kind of believe one could have really got to it. Um, I'm going to pick out Sean's um, question and then Mark um, at uh, five past seven. Um, so Shans raises a very interesting uh, point, which is, did you find any crossovers with the Islamic interpretation of Jesus as a man um, and, and a prophet, in fact? Um, and then this other question, would you be interested in doing a similar, similar analysis of other religious figures or prophets? Uh, and I thought, well, there's your chance to make a pitch for future <laughs> books. <laughs> I mean, is this the beginning of a Julia, Julian Bagini series? Do we have the, 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 yeah. the prophet and the Buddha to come? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't really, again, I had, I think it's what I appreciated. I was doing a very, very na deliberately narrow um, exercise here. With, it's a kind of a thought experiment, right? And it is really addressed at this people who, you know, if, if you don't believe Jesus is the son of God, you don't believe the gospels are divinely inspired, right? Then Jesus is kind of like Plato Socrates. He's a, he's a kind of character based on a real person who comes to us in these texts. And that's all I'm interested in looking at with the divine stripped out. Um, and so I, I, the, the Jesus in Islam, he's still a prophet. So he's still in that theological framing. So I didn't really think I, I should be should be looking at that. Would there be a would there be other people to look at? Well, you know what? I think that in, in lots of ways, pro 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 probably not. I don't think you could do it with the prophet, not just because um, it's, you know, fraught ground i just think that, that muhammad is uh, he, he's a historical figure unambiguously in a way that jesus isn't i think for a start and so uh, yeah, the, 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 there's there's a, there's a different story to be made there of course a lot of people have i think the, the figure people have done this more than with anything is with with the buddha of course and the buddha i mean you know i know it's a great interest of your, yours madeline and you know a lot of people don't even see buddhism as a religion i don't think obviously many strands of buddhism i think have become religions but there's lots of really interesting writing on understanding um you know the buddha's teaching in a particular completely secular way but you know people like stephen bachelor for example have already done that very very well indeed so i've got nothing to add to that <laughs> Um, and then Mark says um, he once read through the gospel trying to see what Jesus kept up on going on about. Mm. Um, and he came up with the kingdom. And mm. I know that you talk about this at length. And of course, it is a really key concept, the kingdom of God. Yeah. Perhaps you could just give your kind of interpretation of this phrase of Jesus. Is. Well, that's a very good question. I think it's a very astute ob observation, too. Uh, because you know, I was looking at what to strip out. Did I strip out the, the this this idea of the, the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven or the, the kingdom of God? And um, I didn't think I did. I didn't have to because. So first of all, um, the word I think is basilica or something uh, or basilia. I sorry, I, I'm really bad at remembering these fine details. But the the word used, um, a lot of scholars say, has the, more the meaning of the rule of. So it's not it's not kind of a place, the kingdom is not a place. And of course, a lot of what Jesus says explicitly says that my kingdom is not of this world, but also, you know, um, he talks about the kingdom being within you, right? So I think what we're talking about here is the kind of the rule of heaven, if you like. Now, that can be understood in ways which are theologically infused. 
but they can be understood in ways which are more secular. And a good comparison here is with Confucian thought, actually. So in Confucian uh, philosophy, they talk about the way of heaven. But Confucianism isn't about, an, you know, they don't, there's no interest in their life to come an otherworldly thing. The way of heaven is more like kind of the way things should be. It's kind of the order of nature. It, 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 so there's a, there's a moral dimension to it. This is the way things ought to be. And, you know, something humans are answerable to, but it's not kind of like a place and it's certainly not governed by any kind of a monotheistic God. So I think that it, it, it is important here that what Jesus is interested in establishing is that we are governed as individuals and as a society by uh, principles which are higher and which we are answerable to in some way. And that is more important than any kind of certainly life to come or any kind of actual political or ecclesiastical authority. So that's the way I would understand it. I think that's something that, I mean, it's interesting, of course, many things I say um, are completely at odds with what you would say if you were a Christian, because the divine's taking out of it, but a lot isn't actually. Um, a lot of what I say, people who are practicing Christians can entirely believe, uh, go along with. In particular, the idea that, you know, Jesus has to be rescued from this image of the meek and mild baby in the manger, etc., into someone who's actually very, very challenging and actually difficult to follow. You know, making Jesus back into a difficult figure, I think, is something that a lot of uh, Christians kind of would be um, applauding in, in what I'm doing, even if they don't agree with uh, lots of other things. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very, very good point. Um... I mean, it, it definitely comes out from your book that, that, that Jesus' vision is very bleak. There's a kind of millenarianism, which is, you know, he was expecting the world to end imminently. Mm. Uh, and it's very, it's very dark, isn't it? And, and in, I wondered if you could just link that, Julian, to, of course, the historical circumstances in which he was living, which were extremely dark. And um, we have one question here about, you know, the Roman Empire was very, very oppressive. And you make a number of points on that front. Mm. Um, about how Roman soldiers could just take clothing, they could just take a cloak, they could force you to carry um, uh, burdens, uh, um, both of which then find their way into incidents in Jesus' life where he says if somebody asks for your cloak you, you give it and if mm. you turn the other cheek and so there was a sort of, um, it, Jesus was, was talking to a time of huge mm. sort of oppression and violence, brutal violence, yeah, I think that's true. So, so take the first point. I think that most scholars, Bible scholars would agree that, you know, there was this belief the end times were coming. And, you know, so if, that the whole, if you read the gospel as the whole package, end times were anticipated and the same in the epistles. Uh, so that's something obviously that just doesn't make sense in the secular uh, version. The thing about the oppression of the Romans, I think that is an important context. And I think there are, there are certain things which are very clear here too. And, and this goes back to the, what we're saying about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Jesus was absolutely not advocating revolution. He was not advocating overthrowing the Romans. That would have been a futile thing to attempt anyway. So in a sense, he was being realistic. He was interested in a kind of a more pr profound rule. So whatever's going on in terms of oppression, can we find a way to live with, with dignity and honor. And that's why there's a very interesting interpretation, which I entirely bought into, and someone will tell me they, they, they don't, about these commands to turn the other cheek and, you know, and give the two cloaks to the one who has one, etc., etc. And let's just stick to one, because otherwise we'll be here a long time. The thing about turning the other cheek is that, the, you know, a, a Roman would you know, a Roman could, could, could slap you around the cheek. There's, there are very strict rules, actually, on what the Romans could, could do. You know, they weren't allowed to be too brutal because it was all about trying to keep things um, in their place. But they could be, a certain level of brutality was, was mandated. So you could slap. And the point, the point there is that if, if someone slaps you with the cheek, that's a kind of a humiliation. When you turn the other cheek, what you're saying is really you haven't humiliated me, you haven't defeated me, my, I, I, my honour is still intact in some way, you know. And, and, and those other sayings have similar kind of interpretations. So I think what, what he's really interested there is, is giving people a way of maintaining their dignity and self-respect and their own, as it were, moral compass 
in a political situation where they had no chance of changing the, the political structures. So now that may be, and I think this is where the context of the time does make things different. In Jesus's time, it made sense to be, as it were, fatalistic about the opportunities for bringing about big political change, feeding the poor, whatever it might be. We don't live in that age anymore, right? So this is why I think, you know, now we, we do have the opportunity, if we grasp it, to, to, to lift millions out of poverty. And we also have opportunities to make sure we don't have oppressive governments. And so in that sense, you know, the, the fact we're in a different context means that Jesus's message may not be entirely appropriate for today. And who knows? And for that reason, who knows what he would have made of things today? And by the way, sorry, another point here. That's what also I often talk about how a lot of what Christians have said and believed over the times is in conflict with what Jesus said. But they do have there is a kind of a line of defense which sometimes works, which is that we, you'll never kind of know. <laughs> we never know just by looking at those texts what the spirit of the message would mean applied to our times. So sometimes we do have to kind of update things and change things and try and come to our best judgment about how to follow this spirit of the teaching in different times. Yeah, I wondered, I mean, the, there are some very, very inspirational Christians who have absolutely been able to use uh, the teaching of Jesus. And I'm thinking of Martin Luther King as a very, very good example, or Bonhoeffer. I, I don't know if your research kind of involved looking at their lives and the way in which they both were able to um, draw inspiration and guidance uh, at times of great, uh, you know, in fighting oppression. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I think there has been a lot. Of, there, there actually, in, something not in this book. I, I contributed a chapter to a, to a book edited by, by Tom Holland in which I kind of, which is addressing the question about, you know, why has Jesus remained such a powerful figure two centuries, um, two millennia? You know later and obviously the answer is there are many reasons I, I can't give the reason but I think one reason for this is that there, the, the, because in a way what he says is at times uh, open to interpretation and we can also say changing times there's a lot of opportunity to to make Jesus into whatever you want to make him into and to whatever your time demands and you know, throughout history, we've had everything from warmongering Jesus to pacifist Jesus to prosperity gospel to poverty gospel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, I just think that you know, we, we, there are the resources in these teachings for all sorts of different um, inspiration. In terms of, and you are right, you know, there are people who have been motivated by their Christian faith to do remarkable things uh, for humanity, and I think for those people. Uh, what they've really what's resonated most with them is you know the, the teachings that are against you know the powerful and the wealth and about compassion and and sympathy um i can see how that happens i actually think though that if you i think the most consistent reading of of the gospels um does sort of teach us and more of a detachment from the world than that to be honest um i'm rather pleased that in that respect many christians have taking it in a slightly different direction. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So you think that, that you know, thankfully Martin Luther King wasn't reading his gospel too closely. <laughs> well, in a, in a way, yes. But I mean, that's not kind of like, I mean, that sounds like sound ridiculous. What, what, what a thing to say. Um, look, he probably was reading them closely, but he was reading them closely in conjunction with other things. I mean, this is the other point as well. You know, we never, we never kind of, people often claim to be, you know, Bible-believing Christians. They believe that, everything they believe is coming directly from the Bible. And that's, that's kind of never true. There are always other assumptions and other things going on. And, and there's a strong tr uh, trend in Christianity to kind of understand that, you know, Christianity is itself a, a dynamic thing. So the gospels are foundational and the Bible is foundational, but the church itself has to grow. And there's a kind of, you know, in, in the Catholicism, there's an the explicit idea that God continues to reveal his will through the operations of the church over time. So yeah, what I'm saying is that, you know, it's not that he wasn't reading his Gospels carefully, but he uh, was in he, his, his, the context in which he interpreted the Gospels, you know, added things to that and, and 
um, made it something more than could be purely found there. If you were to restrict yourself to simply reading the Gospels, I think you, the way of life you would uh, advocate would perhaps be more like a kind of a monastic life in a way in which, you know, the monastic life is about um, creating inner purity in the self and, and service of the community is, is a fairly minor thing, actually, typically. I've got one last question, Julian, and um, uh, you, you, you must have spent, you know, quite a few months reading uh, um, the Bible, uh, then the, the, the Gospels. Um, you spent, as it were, quite a lot of time with Jesus, this figure of Jesus. Um, and does that have any lasting impact? What, what's, what's that left you with? Because it seems to me that every time, you know, I always love the, the phrase of André Gide, you know, which is the book that's failed is the book that has left you unchanged. <laughs> um, one of my, you know, great kind of philosophies, I think, you know, a book has to change you. And when it comes to writing a book, it has to change you even more. Um, otherwise the project wasn't worth doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have to say that, I mean, in some ways, um, uh, I think one of the things that is almost a bit depressing about human beings is that um, real major change is, is, is rare. Um, very few things turn your life around 180 degrees. But I think that every time you read something or work on something which has any kind of uh, benefit, it, it does something to sort of rearrange the furniture of your mind is an is, is a old metaphor I sometimes find. No, 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 I think that's a good, it's a good metaphor. I'm not talking about sort of, you know, you clearly haven't been, yeah. you know, been yeah. converted, but if, if, if this book has rearranged a bit mm. of furniture, what, what's the bit, the bit of furniture it's moved? Well, I, th I think that actually it's, I think a couple of things. I mean, we haven't talked about um, forgiveness, but I think actually I, I did come to understand forgiveness in a, in a, in a much uh, richer way through, through looking at this. And, and you can sum it up about forgiveness isn't about, you know, granting absolution. It's about trying to restore relationships. And that's why it's not actually unconditional. It, you know, forgiveness only works when the person you're forgiving plays their part in the bargain. And I think that, you know, and I think I think that's the most authentic notion of I think it's the authentic forgiveness notion of forgiveness we get from Jesus. I think Jesus actually does give us a, a really um, important thing about it. And the other thing is about non-judgment, non actually. Um, I think that's a really important thing that, you know, the, 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 some of the sayings of this are very famous, you know, to cast out the um, moat in your own eye before, um, you know, looking at the speck in, in your brothers. And I think that the, 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 the teaching there about how we have to be so much on our guard to, to not fall into that trap of judging others. But at the same time, not judging others is not the same as sort of like not taking a view on important moral issues. So Jesus doesn't judge the adulteress, but he does judge adultery. And it's a really important difference. So I, th I, think, I think those teachings around non-judgment and forgiveness are the ones that perhaps have had a greatest impact on me. Other things I found interesting, but perhaps I just haven't bought into them. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely terrific. Thank you so much, Julian. I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. My apologies to people who made very interesting comments that we didn't manage to get through all of them. I think we, we did a fair chunk. Um, and I am uh, gonna hand over to Matt, who will draw our fascinating discussion to an end. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you, Madeline, thank you. Well, thank you so much to, to both of you. That was, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, let me just say a, a number of quick thanks. Um, one is to the audience. It's, it's, it's always fantastic to do these events um, in York, both in person and now online, because the audience is so engaged, asks such interesting questions, and indeed turns up, uh, <laughs> really, or, or virtually. So thank you to you. Thank you very much to the events team at the University of York. These events don't just happen. They take an enormous amount of work by enormously talented people um, from audiovisual all the way through to, to organizers. So thanks to them. Um, but what I'd really, uh, and oh, just before I before I forget, uh, books both by Madeline and by Julian are available from our our, um, our sort of in well not in house but our our favoured bookseller, the Fox Lane Books, um, which is a wonderful uh, uh, independent bookseller who sends absolutely lovely parcels if you order from her. Um, so all of those things done. Let me just say that was utterly fabulous and. We haven't done a Heslington lecture for a while, and now I'm I'm keen that we should do more because it was just a brilliant example of how to talk about religion in a way that is relevant to where we are. So thank you very much to Madeline. I, I hugely, 
envious of your ability to, to multitask, um, to ask fabulous questions, but also to, to engage uh, with the audience and to do all of these things at the same time. And thank you very much to Julian for writing the book, for agreeing to come and for just a wonderful set of answers uh, that were thought provoking, incomplete, but incomplete in a sense in the best possible way of leaving people with more to think about. So thank you very much to all of you and all of you in the audience, stay safe. And I hope we'll see you soon at the Festival of Ideas where indeed you can see Madeline again. And details of that will appear on the slide now. <laughs>